behind the hate man, and that's what we're talking about this morning with Hallelujah Picasso's man, Peter McLennan, joining me in the Kiwi studio as well. Morning, Peter. Morning. Golly gosh, this is the um, the reissue, well not reissue, but it's a retrospective, isn't it, of um, the work of Hallelujah Picasso's between yeah, 1988 and 1996. It's basically just trying to get our music back out in circulation. I mean, we're going to reissue all of our other back catalogue as well, because everybody's got their own favourite song off one of our releases they want to get their hands on, so... True. Some of even some of the earlier cassette releases we're trying to reissue as well, but this is just sort of like, you know, making our mark in the sand and saying here we are back again. Yeah, you know, it's not all flying none. There was some other music in the nineties yeah. that was good, and it was us. And, and it was almost that other record label, Wildside, is what you guys. Yeah, I mean, were Wildside in the nineties had a very big profile with like She Hard had like a whole Dead Flowers, a whole bunch of bands. Murray Kimmick, of course, yeah. was the um, was the guy who uh, must have signed you. Yeah, at the time. I mean, yeah. Murray had Southside Records before that, which was mainly a lot of. Dance acts like Abba Posse and um, House Party of Fumana. I think he basically shifted into doing Wildside because he was doing a lot of bands that had a lot of samples and that was costing him a lot of money in clearing samples. And he basically saw that rock bands huh. were a lot easier to deal with because they were at originals. Yeah. T- tell me the signing wasn't re- like like documents and, and lawyers and stuff. It was more of a gentleman's handshake or something along those lines. Well, How did that well go? the first label that was in- interested in us that we worked with was um, Trevor Riki with Pagan Records. He, okay. he picked up our song Clap Your Hands for his compilation Positive Vibrations in 1989. Yeah. And we were going to do a single and an album with him. And at that time, he could offer us, uh, offer, offer us an album deal, which was basically doing the album on cassette and vinyl. And we wanted to do the album on cassette and CD, basically, because we get the longer running time, because we had a lot of material, because all four members of the band wrote and sang. So we had a lot of songs we wanted to get out on our first album. So we ended up shifting from Wildside, from um, Pagan to Wildside. The sound of Helly Loop Cassos, um, back when you started in 88, Ska, Roots... When we started, we were a garage punk band called The Rattlesnakes because we were all really big fans of The Cramps. And The Cramps, most of their songs only had three chords, which were the three chords we knew, so that's what we started with yeah. until we actually you know, learned how to play and got a bit better, <laughs> yeah. as bands do. What but were you playing? Guitar. Okay. It was uh, myself, Roland on vocals, Johnny Payne joined later on bass, and Bobby Long on drums. And we sort of developed our sound and we changed our name and... 1989 to the Halley Picasso's because we were, we were sort of picking up, we were big reggae fans, um, loved well, Scar, Punk, stuff like Bad Brains, Fishbone, and sort of developed the style, sort of like, I think it was called Crossover back in the day, or we called it Picasso Call. Yeah. Basically, because people were quite confused about what we play because we like playing all those genres quite often within the same song. Yeah. Which, so you, which, was, which was, wasn't was really done back then. It you know, sort of confused a few people. So you really were doing your own thing, and, and, and it was unique? Pretty much. I mean, I think in terms of New Zealand, we didn't have any contemporaries that huh. were doing the same thing. There were yeah. a lot of bands that we were friends with, obviously, but in terms of what we were doing, there weren't really any other bands mixing up genres like that. What about, um, I mean, live? Was there, was there a good live scene for you guys at that time? That's pretty much how we built our name, because we didn't get any airplay on commercial radio. I mean, back in the early 90s, Commercial radio, unless your name was Finn or Dobbin, you were invisible on commercial radio. Yeah. Less than two percent of New Zealand music was on commercial radio. So but there would have been we had a big g- audience on student radio student and that, radio. Hmm. that also supported our gigs when we do orientation tours and things like that. I mean that's basically how we funded our albums was by going out and playing live and making money that way. In fact I think that's where I saw you at possibly an orientation. Um, Probably event. we used to do a lot of those. Yeah. They were a lot of fun. In ninety five or something like something like that. But that was uh, I guess towards the end of of your of your run. Um, you released a whole bunch of stuff in that time, and that and that's what is you know, showcased on this retrospective. Yeah, I mean, we, as I said, you know, all four members of the band wrote music, so we always had a lot of stuff that we wanted to yeah. get recorded. I mean, we did like between we did two albums, and we also did about half a dozen EPs as well, which which had, were had be, songs off. Well, I mean, they were meant to be singles, but we'd throw in bonus tracks because you but know they were essentially albums. Some of those EP, EPs. Well, yeah, I mean, the last but, one we did, Gospel of the DNA Demon. Well, we call that an EP, but it was about 45, 50 minutes long, which is album length, really. Yeah. Um, the track that we um, we came in on, uh, Lovers, Lovers Plus, that featured um, Greg Johnson. Yeah, it featured Greg Johnson on trumpet and Alice Latham on saxophone. Yeah. Which is a pretty cool thing. I mean, we, we didn't really know how to do... When we were in the studio for the first time recording that album, we didn't really know what we were doing, so we got Alison to do the saxophone part, and then a couple of days later we got Greg in to do the horns, the trumpets. Yeah. And he was like, oh, so what notes is she playing? And we went... Uh, we should have had you guys in the studio at the same time. <laughs> that that, that would have worked much better than... Yeah, but, I mean, Greg Johnson's an amazing musician. He basically picked it up by ear because yeah. you know, he's an amazing jazz player. And and, we, and where did you record? Most of the stuff we did was at the lab. Um, the first recordings we did, because getting into a studio in those days was really expensive, so yeah. the main one we used was BFM had their um, ad production studio, and you could basically 
go up there in the evenings and the weekends and you just basically take over the advertising area, push the desks aside and set up and play there. Really common, I think, in, in the student radio stations yeah, a lot of student, all, all a lot of around student the radio country. stations around the country, basically, that's how a lot of bands did their first recordings. Yeah. It was, you could afford that. They had the that. gear and yeah. the microphones and things. And, and they had much, um, I mean, they only had like, you know, 8-track or 16-track recording gear, but it was like, and it was on tape, of course, back then too, it wasn't all yeah. digital, so... And they had basically, because the gear wasn't like, you know, 24 track or something like that, it was a more affordable rate. Yeah. And, and, and when you did play live, we talked about orientation, but what, what, were the, um, what were the venues that you could play live at back then? Most of the venues in Auckland were like pretty small, like the Glue Pot, or um, there's a place called Pelican Bar on um, Elliott Street, um, which was run by um, Tim and Nick Woods, who were, um, you know, those guys, they were in iHug. Oh, yeah. They before they were doing iHug, they had a bar. And about 94, they put really? a computer on the bar, which you could log on to um, <laughs> chat rooms like Usenet. Yeah. And they started doing um, internet installations for people, and that's basically how they started iHug. Interesting. And they sold the bar, and they had iHug, which was a lot more financially successful than yeah. running a bar. But you played you play there. You played there. I mean, there's a video we did, which um, I was put together with some old footage that I found recently from um, God Gave Us Boom Boom Washington, which mm. is it's great to have a new video out there as well as their old ones, but... That's us playing at the power station, and we used to love playing at the power station because we had enough room to jump around without bumping into each other, which a lot of venues we played at. They were high, really small. high energy shows, right? Yeah, I mean, that's we sort of when we started out, we were like pretty appalling playing live. You know, we used to get cancer on at us a lot, <laughs> um, which is a very good incentive to get better at playing live. Mm. And we started, you know, in around about um, late ninety, we started getting some international sports like opening for Violent Femmes and Faith No More, and you see those guys play, and their, their sets were really tight, like mm. you know. They'd finish one song, take a breath, drummer a can off, next song, bang into the next song. And we sort of thought, oh, we should start doing that too, because it was a really good way of, when you're playing live, building up momentum. Because there are a lot of bands around then, I don't know if it's still the same now, but you sort of see a band play and they sort of muck around between songs and talk to their mates in the crowd yeah. and then play another song. And it's like, you know, it's, we were sort of about holding people's attention. So we sort of developed this approach to playing live, which we called Search and Destroy, <laughs> which was a, basically meant that, you know, the audience had to be as exhausted as we were by right. the time we finished because, you know, we were there to play as hard as we possibly could. It was like shock and awe. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. <laughs> yeah. So it sounds to me like the, the career of the Picassos was about you, you guys getting better and better at what you did. Did you end up then quitting at your height, you know, the best that you guys were? What what happened but, at the end? Well, then we got to a point where, I mean, there's all a lot of, we were talking about this with um, Roland the other day, and it's like there's always a lot of creative tension in the band, which is why we produce so much music, yeah. and then sort of, by the end of it, the creative element had dropped out, and there was just quite a bit of tension, and I sort of, by 95, I was saying we should, you know, take a break for six months or something, and the others wanted to keep going, and I think if we'd actually had a break, we'd probably still be going, but it, right. it was basically like we'd built up a mem- momentum to a point where, we needed to do something new and we, we weren't really in a financial position to get ourselves to you know Australia or the UK or somewhere yeah I mean probably if we'd toured Europe we would probably have found a really good audience because that sort of crossover style was really big I mean the irony is if we'd stuck around like by about a couple of years after we broke up that sort of ska punk thing like Rancid and Sublime and all those bands suddenly became really popular we actually would have been cool for like a whole five minutes yeah but did well did, yeah, well that's right and did it feel like Supergroove perhaps we're cutting the lunch somewhat they were probably in a different sort of category because I mean back then you had this argument which you know thankfully died off where you know you're talking about bands that are mainstream or alternative mm. and they were actually a band that you managed to crack the mainstream mm. which I mean they probably they were groundbreakers in that sense because there were a lot of New Zealand bands that came after them who were like able to get commercial success because Supergroove had actually managed to get on radio. But did, did you feel in the end that you guys were ahead of, ahead of your time a little bit? For the New Zealand scene, not necessarily for the international scene. But. You can say that in hindsight. Yeah. We didn't really say it at the time, and we were just basically, you know, we were pretty uncompromising in terms of our approach. Yeah. Yeah. Um, putting together a retrospective can't be easy, selecting the tracks, right? How, do, how long has this some, taken? Uh, there were some prolonged discussions, yeah. shall we say? I mean, we had a... I've had a few friends of ours, like there's um, a mate of ours who helped put together a track listing, which was basically good to have somebody outside the band do it, in terms of trying to balance something so it's got songs that were popular that everybody wants to hear, but also ones that you know, we thought were a little bit underexposed as well. And in listening back to some of the songs, do you are you happy with how they s- sound still now, or, or do you think, oh man, some of yeah, these I mean, could do was, with some reworks? Or? I was sort of in the studio when we were doing the remastering with um, Alan Jensen and Rick Huntington and Upturn Studios, and that was... It was really exciting to sort of like load in the songs and sort of hear them through studio speakers yeah. again. Because the main problem we had with a lot of our recordings was that they got sent off to Australia to get um, manufactured through festival. 
And because it was like, you know, coming from Festival New Zealand to Festival Australia from one of their, you know, wild side, it was basically um, all care and no responsibility, shall we say. So yeah. some of our recordings didn't end up being anywhere near as good as they should have been in terms of the finished product, in terms of the audio quality. Like right. Especially our first album is way quieter than it should have been. So going back and actually hearing this stuff and listening to it intensely has been really satisfying because a lot of the production ideas we had freaked out the studio engineers we work with, like you know, like Mark Turney and Chris Sinclair, but they were like really into them because we had very different ideas about what we wanted to do, you know, which was influenced by um you know, the hip hop stuff we were hearing in the early nineties, the Jamaican dance hall, which, you know, had things like, you know, huge kick drums and things like that. Yeah. And then and the big dubs and delays, um, I'd imagine would have been much more, I suppose, um, organically produced back then as opposed to now where you can do everything digitally and Yeah, it's true. It's like I remember because you're, you're still a producer now under the yeah, Asylum name, yeah. so what you do now is probably quite different to how well, it's Well, it's like, you know, I can automate a mix on my computer, whereas back then, you know, it was like 10 people with all their hands, and you're sort of like shouting cues on the mix while yeah. we're trying to do a dub mix. And I mean, <laughs> there was a dub, dub version we did of Rewind. I think it took us about 12 goes to get it right. Right. Because you'd sort of be halfway through, and somebody would mute something, and you'd hit the wrong button, and you'd mute the whole track, and right. you'd go, oh, crap, we've got to start again. Yeah, so it has to be done live, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. a live dub mix. I mean, that's... That was one of the fun things about the reggae stuff we did is we weren't trying to be a reggae band, but we were using reggae ideas and what we did. Yeah. Okay. What about a um, a re- reformation of the band to oh, celebrate? Like leave the house and do some work. <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, we did a reunion in '99 for um, BFM for their 30th birthday, which yeah. was a lot of people have asked had asked us over the years. You know, are you going to do a reunion? Blah blah blah. Yeah. And, none of the reasons that people wanted us to do reunions, like you know, oh, can you play at my birthday party? No. Um, but, but, to, but BFM was sort of like a no-brain in terms of because they were basically our sole supporter support. in Auckland. But 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 to celebrate the release of this, surely, surely, it's it's worthy of. Um, we'll getting do back some together. kind of live event next year. I'm not sure what sort of form it'll take because um, our bass player Johnny Payne lives, lives in Indonesia these days, so I'm not sure if he's going to be involved in it or not. Mm. But we'll do some sort of live event for it. I mean, but, at the moment it's pretty much you know November, so yeah, it is we'll let them have moment. that month. Yeah, 2012 perhaps. Um, but you all still get on, you're all friends. Yeah, I mean, still. that's one of the things that, you know, I love about those guys, I and mean, we're still all friends, mm. which is, you know, I mean, that's when we started out as a band, we weren't, like, trying to be, you know, real clever dick musicians, because we weren't, but we were all serious music fans. Mm. Let's um, go out on a tune, I think one of my favourites. Is that all right if I play one of my favourites? Your radio show, do what you like. <laughs> I want to play um, Smoking and Fuming. Uh, which you can get right now. Now, I actually tell everyone about the um, the website where people can. Yeah, find if you want to find out more about it, you can check out picassocore.blogspot.com, which has got all the information about buying it. We've got the music up on uh, iTunes and Amplifier. There's also a really cool digital e booklet that comes with it as well. Some great photos up there as well, and you can also watch share memories perhaps of Hello Picasso games. Yeah, yeah, get gigs in touch and... if you've got some old photos or anything. We'd love to see them. Yeah, awesome. All right, Peter McLennan from Hello Picasso is joining us in the Kiwi Studio. Um, here is uh, the uh, the track "Smoking and Fuming" here on Kiwi.